Hello, and welcome to Y'all Monitor Brief. It's Thursday, June 6. I'm Kristen Tolman. Today's main segment is a conversation with Kelsey Davenport, the director for non-proliferation policy at the Arms Control Association. We'll discuss the International Atomic Energy Agency's board of director vote yesterday to center Iran for the first time since November 2022. But first, let's get you caught up on the headlines. At least 18 combatants have been killed in battles between Yemeni government forces and Iran-backed Houthi rebels in the country's southwest. A hospital in central Gaza said Thursday at least 37 people were killed in Israeli bombardment overnight of a UN-run school, which the Israeli military said housed a Hamas compound. Israel's war cabinet is set to convene Thursday after a series of drone attacks targeting Upper Galilee region injured at least 11 people. And as the country's prime minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, said preparation is underway for a very intense operation. Saudi Arabia is the latest country to join a multi-country initiative for central bank digital currency amid increasing interest from the Gulf state in futuristic forms of money. Waving flags and many chanting anti-Arab slogans, thousands of Israeli nationalists marched through annexed East Jerusalem's old city on Wednesday with main streets empty of Palestinians fearing attacks. A court in Turkey jailed Wednesday a pro-Kurdish mayor for 19 and a half years on terrorism charges, his lawyer said, a ruling denounced as a coup d'etat by his party. A fresh offering of shares in Saudi Aramco, the Gulf country's largely state-owned oil behemoth, comes at a pivotal moment for sweeping economic reforms that have struggled to lure foreign investment. And before we go on to the main segment, I just want to let our listeners know that this conversation was recorded Wednesday evening. So if you hear references to today, just know that that's for Wednesday and this podcast comes out Thursday. And now on to the main segment. Hi, Kelsey. Welcome to the I'm on it a Brief. Thanks so much for having me. So over the last couple of days, there has been the meeting in Vienna for the International Atomic Energy Agency, and it's made quite a splash of the news today. So Kelsey, can you walk us through what happened and how the United States joining its European partners in censoring Iran at the nuclear watchdog on Wednesday was a move that everyone was kind of waiting with bated breath to see if the U.S. would do? So the International Atomic Energy Agency's Board of Governors, which is comprised of 35 member states of the agency, passed a resolution this week condemning Iran for failing to cooperate with a years-long investigation into the presence of undeclared nuclear materials in Iran uh, and Iran's failure to meet its international safeguards obligations. Now, this resolution has garnered a lot of media attention, in part because of reporting that the United States wasn't on board with the European strategy until this week when the resolution actually passed. Uh, But the censure resolution itself really shouldn't come as a surprise. The IAEA's Board of Governors meets four times a year, and at the last meeting in March, The Europeans made very clear that they would pursue this resolution in June uh, if Iran failed to cooperate with the agency's years-long investigation into these undeclared nuclear materials and activities. And over the past quarter, you know, despite a meeting between Iran and the agency, including the International Atomic Energy Agency's Director General Rafael Mariano Grossi, there really was no progress. So I think the Europeans felt compelled to act to demonstrate to Iran that there are consequences for Tehran's failure to meet its international obligations. Right. And so, and is it clear and correct to say that the U.S. was worried to join in with their European partners because they were worried that this would just only escalate things further to sort of condemn them in a public space? Condemn the Iranians, that is? I think the United States has a, a tight rope to walk on this issue. You know, on one hand, it is very clear that the center resolution against Iran is warranted. And the IAEA has documented several areas where Iran is failing to meet its legally its legal obligations under the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty uh, to provide the International Atomic Energy Agency with information and access. And the U.S. doesn't dispute that. I think where the U.S. concern is, is that Iran typically reacts to these resolutions by further ratcheting up 
its nuclear program immediately. And given regional tensions in the region, particularly between Iran and Israel, I think the United States is very focused on preventing these tensions from escalating into a broader conflict. So I think there was concern on the Biden administration side that you know, this censure not kick off a cycle of escalation that could trigger a broader conflict. But in the U.S. statement, you know, announcing its support for the resolution, U.S. Ambassador to the IAEA, Laura Holgate, made a very important point that this censure resolution should be part of a strategy to de-escalate nuclear tensions with Iran and find an effective solution to the Iranian nuclear crisis that includes working the IAEA and Iran working together to resolve these outstanding issues and for Iran to meet its safeguards obligations. So I think that is the should be the crucial focus right now is what is the strategy to prevent this censure resolution and Iran's response from escalating escalating further and how you know can this censure be used as you know the stick that's then compared with the carrot to try to push Iran to you know to negotiate with the agency uh, to be more transparent about its nuclear program and to address these long standing questions about its past nuclear activities and Kelsey, I'm glad you brought up Holgate's statement because that's the, that end quote of sort of tying the resolution to a broader strategy seems to be what a lot um, a lot of the media attention afterwards was fixated on. The director general Grossi, there was a really great piece in the New York Times, kind of looking at how he's become this almost like a diplomat going between Moscow and Tehran, and then also you know Vienna and sort of Western capitals is. From your point of view, I mean, I'm I'm curious if you have any thoughts of does Grossi, is he, a, you know, is he a partner um, or partners, maybe the wrong word, but a voice that can can push Iran closer to the table with meeting its um, meeting its requirements? Or I'm just curious if you have any thoughts there. I think Grossi has an important role to play in documenting Iran's nuclear activities and raising concerns when it appears that Iran is not meeting its international obligations and reiterating to Iran the importance of monitoring and and transparency and the importance of Iran fulfilling its safeguards obligations. But what Iran has done is tied the outstanding issues it has with the agencies to the broader political situation that it faces you know, with the United States and Europe in the wake of the demise of the 2015 nuclear deal. And the Iranians have made clear to Grossi on multiple occasions that they are looking for sanctions relief in exchange for enhanced monitoring and cooperation with the agency's safeguards investigation. Mm. The IAEA cannot put sanctions relief on the table. And really, it's the United States that can offer meaningful economic benefits. So I think Grossi certainly has a job to do in supporting and enforcing the IAEA safeguards mandate and tracking Iran's nuclear program. But he can't bring to the table uh, what Iran wants, and nor, nor should he. I mean, this is a negotiation that you know should take place kind of between world powers, and the right. IAEA should you know be remain focused you know on its its mandate and its safeguards obligations. Yeah, for sure. And Kelsey, the last question for you, while our listeners and and I have you, is if we zoom out to just a ten thousand feet, what is the world of nuclear policy and what are what are you seeing and watching and looking at every day and and what what should our listeners be looking out for well i'm really glad you raised this question because it's so important not to look at iran's nuclear program in a vacuum and that's another reason why the censure resolution you know was important i mean it not only demonstrates to iran that there are consequences for its failure to cooperate But it also sends a message to other would-be proliferators that the IAEA board will respond if states aren't meeting their safeguards obligations. And that's quite critical right now when there are other states in the region, most notably Saudi Arabia, that might be looking to match Iran's capabilities by developing the ranges of technologies that would be necessary to produce nuclear weapons, and other countries outside of the region, you know, South Korea, for instance, that might see advantages in becoming a nuclear weapons threshold state. 
So the center is not you know, just about Iran. It's about demonstrating support for the agency, and it's about strengthening and upholding nonproliferation norms at a time when these you know, critical norms are under attack. Yeah. Um, and it's just so interesting in the face of a lot of other international bodies and organizations are, are, are kind of in a moment of uncertainty. So to see the IEA kind of double down on the power that it has and, and send her messages is, is fascinating. Kelsey, thank you so, so much. We really appreciate your time. Yeah, thanks for having me. That's it for today, June 6. You can read all these stories and more impacting the region at allmonitor.com. <laughs>